Okay. Last time we were talking about net present value. And we said that every single number that we use in our capital budgeting projects is what sort of a number? Starts with an S. Swag. Scientific wild ass guess, right? Now we said that your your future cash flows are less certain. Oh, for shame, he's late. Your your future cash flows are even less certain. But people think that the time zero Canada, the time zero cash flow is certain. Is that true? No. Remember the example about the, the concrete floor that we had to totally redo in order to get started. It was an expense we didn't expect. And I told you the way that we handle that is to put on a contingency percentage, and I recommend using 10%. It always worked out for me. Okay, now let's talk about what's needed for NPV. We need the initial investment amount, we need the future cash flows and their timing, and we need a discount rate appropriate to the risk of the future cash flows. That last one, that's what chapter 12 was all about. Figuring out what is that discount rate that is appropriate to the risk of the future cash flows. So this example is so pathetic, I'm not even gonna use it, uh, but you guys know how to work this. If the NPV of this project is 94 cents, according to the rule, do we accept it or reject it? According to the rule, we would accept it because it is greater than zero, right? According to the rule, we would accept it because it's greater than zero. Now, if we're looking at real world projects and we get an NPV of 94 cents, well, what I would do is just pull a dollar bill out of my pocket, hand it to my manager and say, let's skip this project, right? Because I'm going to have to go out there and, and build a factory or whatever, and I know that things are crazy and the chances are it won't work out right. So I'm just going to hand them a dollar and, and get them to go away. Okay, now, what does it mean for shareholder wealth, though? That 94 cents represents the increase in the owner's wealth. So let's assume that there were 94 shares outstanding. If I have a 94 cent positive NPV and I've got 94 shares outstanding, each, the share price should go up by one cent. Let me give you some easier math here. If I have 100,000 shares outstanding, and my project has a positive NPV of $100,000, the stock price should go up by $1 as a result of accepting the project. Okay, now, once again, we are interested, uh, what's the goal of financial management? Maximize shareholder wealth. And so our rule is to take on every positive NPV project. So let's ask ourselves, we said we were going to balance all of these rules off of our three criteria. And we are going to award a star for every yes answer we get from up here. Unlike Amazon, we don't have five stars here. This is only three stars. So three star would be perfect. So let's ask ourselves this. Does NPV account for the time value of money? Yes, how? Anybody know? Okay, let's talk about how. Oh, for shame, she's even later. Go ahead. But um, calculating the future cash flow. Okay, yeah, we're finding the present value of the future cash flows. That's how we're accounting for the time value of money. Uh oh, this thing followed you to your desk out of trying to shame you. Boy, it's just not giving up, is it? Okay, there we go. Now everyone around the world will know you were late. <laughs> By the way, most of my YouTube viewers are outside of the US. Americans don't want to watch me for whatever reason. Okay, back to the story. Um, next, account for the riskiness of the cash flows. Does NPV account for the riskiness of the cash flows? Oh, you're saying no. Why do you think it doesn't? 
because you have to make an assumption about the quantity of tithing of those cash flows at the beginning, so it doesn't account for how those may change going forward. Okay, uh, but part of what we're building into our discount rate is the assumption of the uncertainty of those cash flows. Does that make sense? I see his point, but yeah, to have the NPV, you gotta have the risk. Yeah, and so that's, that's how... Whether it's assumed or not. Yeah, that's how we're accounting for the risk of the cash flows is through the discount rate. <clears throat> and if you uncover a new source of risk, guess what? We're gonna raise that discount rate to account for it. Okay, so now we're, so we've got two yeses, two stars. The third question is, does it provide information about the wealth created by the project? Ms. Daryani. Yes. Yes. In fact, it provides us dollars and cents, right? It doesn't just tell us if we are creating wealth. It tells us how much. Now, once again, NPV is a swag, a scientific wild ass guess but it is our best guess of how much wealth we'll be producing. Questions? Well, what makes it, what makes it the best guess? Is it the, the fact that you gotta do the assumption of the risk? Is that the... Well, that so... That, that uh, I don't know, best guess? Uh, so the best, it's every single thing that we put in here is a best guess, right? So you're making a cake here, and you're putting in your best guess flour and your best guess eggs and your best guess oil, and the cake that's gonna come out is gonna be your best guess of what a cake should be. That's how we're ending up where we are. Now, am I saying it's perfect? No. And uh, after we get through talking about the other measures, you'll understand why NPV is our best guess. In fact, NPV is the best measure. We'll get to that in a second. Uh, but there, until we find a better way, NPV is the top dog. Other questions? Or yes to all these three questions. Yes! And so it's a three star measure, three out of three. So that makes NPV our gold standard. And so it's the one that every other rule must be compared against. And you're going to see as we go through these numerous other rules that there are none that have three stars. And you'd say, wait a minute, why will we use them? Why would we even care about them? And I'll show you some situations where they work and they work well enough. So let's go from the most complex one to the easiest one. It's called the payback period. And it's just simply the amount of time it takes for your project to break even. The amount of time it takes for your project to break even. Now, what do we mean by break even? That the future positive cash flows are enough to balance out the initial negative cash flow. At, the po at that point, we have achieved payback, and the amount of time it takes to get to that point is the payback period. So, we have a rule here, and the rule is to accept all projects that pay back on or before an arbitrary cutoff. Now, that cutoff's gonna be in years, months, days, whatever units you're using here. The question that I'm gonna ask is, what does arbitrary mean? Random. Not necessarily random but it's definitely not developed through scientific means like our discount rate, right? So the scientific method we use to develop our discount rate, we can explain that theoretically, uh, but unfortunately, the number here appears to have just been pulled out of thin air. Now let me explain to you why it's probably not. When I worked at Halliburton, the uh, vice president of manufacturing had been at GE for over 20 years in their health Group. And in fact, if you've ever had an MRI, you can thank this guy for bringing it to market because he was in charge of that project. So, do you think this guy's been around for a while and might know something? Yeah! And so he was the one who chose the arbitrary cutoff. Now at the time, I'm a young engineer and I do not understand 
why he is telling me we're not going to accept all positive net present value projects, but we'll get to that in a minute. And so he said, well, we're going to pay back all or before two years. Now, that means if I had a project that paid back exactly at two years, would I accept it or reject it? Yeah, it's all on, right, so I'm going to accept it. So uh, be sure to write that on your note sheet. So the discount rate, it is determined based on the senior projects in the industry? Right, or we say by looking at the, uh, the required return on the capital for the firm, and if we could find a pure play firm, then we would just use the weighted average cost of capital for that firm. It would be lovely to be able to find such things. Or is it pretty rare to be able to do so? Mm -hmm. Yeah. OK. Now, what do we need for payback? First of all, we need the initial investment amount, and we need the future cash flows and their timing. Do those first two ingredients look familiar? Yeah, they're exactly the same as NPV. But instead of a discount rate that we have scientifically determined using the markets as our laboratory, uh, we're going to come up with this arbitrary cutoff, which is uh, the pronouncement of someone who hopefully has some experience and knows what they're talking about. So here is our payback example number one. When you get a problem for payback, you're only going to get the first two columns. You're only going to get the first two columns. The third column is the one that you need to create and calculate. So at time zero, what does this mean? It means at time zero, we are investing $50,000 in a project. How do I know it's an investment? Negative. Negative, very good. Okay, now at that time, I'm going to say that the balance is negative $50,000. Now, so this is just the opposite of a checkbook, right? This is just the opposite of a checkbook where you make a big deposit and then you make a series of withdrawals. Well here, our balance is starting at negative, and then we're going to be making a series of deposits to pay that withdrawal back. So after that initial investment, our balance is negative 50,000. In year one, we get a positive cash flow of $30,000. How do I get from minus 50,000 to minus 20,000 in my balance column? Yeah, I've got to add that 30,000. So minus 50,000 plus 30,000. Now my balance, my balance is negative 20,000 bucks. Have we broken even yet? No. no. Okay, so we keep going. Year two, we had a cash flow of $20,000. And when I add that to my balance of negative 20,000, what's my new balance? Zero. Have we broken even yet? Yes. yes. What is the payback period for this problem? Two. two years. With the arbitrary cutoff of two years, would I accept or reject the project? Accept. Accept. Oh my goodness, this looks really easy, doesn't it? Sometimes it's not quite so easy, though. All the cash flows here are the same, except for the first one is now minus 40,000 instead of <coughs> minus 50,000. And let me tell you how that happens. When I was an engineer, uh, of course engineers were just interested in solving a problem, but we weren't necessarily worried about the money because after all, it wasn't our money, right? It was the agency problem. It belongs to the shareholders. And so we would just go out and find a machine and we'd say, how much? And they'd say, 700,000. And we'd say, sold. Does that sound like a good business technique? No, what should I do? Negotiate for a better price, right? Plant manager figured out what we were doing. He's like, guys, we have a procurement department. We have a group of people who are trained to get a better price for stuff. And so after that, we had to route all of our projects through procurement. And there was this lady, and her name, I kid you not, was Ramey Dingle. And Ramey Dingle, oh my goodness, she was like a fierce wolverine when it came to getting money out of suppliers. 
And so the suppliers would show up, we'd greet them at the door and they're all smiles. And then they would go spend an hour with Ramey and they would come out looking totally beaten. And then she would walk out smiling and she'd say, guys, I got us $100,000 off. Does that sound good? Yeah. We just saved the shareholder. By the way, the goal of financial management, maximize shareholder wealth. Was Ramey doing it that day? Absolutely. Okay, so now Ramey's got us down to where we're only paying $40,000 for this machine. So that means our beginning balance is minus $40,000. After our year one cash flow, I'm going to add $30,000 to that negative $40,000, and now I'm at negative $10,000. Have I broken even yet? No. In the next year, I have $20,000 positive cash flow, and I'm going to add that to my balance of negative 10,000. What do I have now? Positive $10,000. Have we broken even? Yes. Yeah, somewhere between time one and time two, we broke even. We know we're going to accept the project, right? Because we know we're breaking even before, on or before, the uh, two-year arbitrary cutoff. By the way, it's not always two years. That's just what I'm using here. Okay, now, do you think in finance that we would say, well, that's, that's plenty good. We're not going to worry anymore about this. No. We are going to calculate the amount of time. And when we do, that means we're going to have to come up with some sort of fraction that puts us between year one and year two. So, I'm going to tell you a process to handle this. Number one, we start with the year with the last negative balance. And in this case, which year has our last negative balance? One. Well, that's worthless. I don't even have a trash can in here. And then we are going to create a fraction. We're going to ask, the first question is, how much money do I still owe? In year one, how much money do I still owe? Ten yeah, 10,000. And keep in mind, the way I phrase that, the 10,000 is positive, right? How much money do I still owe? The 10,000 is positive. And then we're going to say, how much money is coming in in the next year? How much money is going to come in in year two? 20,000. And so basically what we're saying is that this thing is going to break even halfway through the year. By the way, how do I know half? Right? Halfway through the year. Now that is based on the assumption that the cash flows in year two are uniform throughout the year. Undoubtedly they will not be. First of all, that's just not how nature works. But secondly, take a look at these cash flows. We're starting at 30,000 and going down to 20,000 and going down to 10,000. When do you think we're likely to have more cash flows? At the beginning of year two or at the end of year two? This cash flow's going down, right? So I'm gonna guess this thing's actually gonna pay back sooner than 1.5 years. But for our purposes, we are going to assume uniform cash flows during that breakover year. And that allows us to make this calculation. So does the last year old balance uh, indicated positive divided by the yeah, next so this year's cash flow? Yes. So I owe ten thousand at the end of this year. Balance. Yeah. And I've got twenty thousand coming in next year. So how much of next year is it going to take me to pay off that balance? So it's ten thousand divided by twenty thousand is going to take me half the year. Questions? Okay, that's how we do the decimals. Now let's talk about the, uh, the three questions. Remember we're giving a star for each one that we can say yes to. Does it account for the time value of money? No, no. We didn't see anything about present value here. We don't have a discount rate, so it doesn't do anything for time value of money. So that's a zero. Uh, does it account for the riskiness of the cash flows? No, there's no discount rate, so it can't account for the riskiness of the cash flows. So there's a second strike. 
And finally, does it provide information regarding the wealth created by the project? Not really. In fact, I could take the same project and I could put uh, different discount rates on it and we could come out with either a positive or a negative NPV project for the same series of cash flows. Payback's not telling us anything about the wealth created by the project. And so it's a zero star measure. And you might say, whew, let's just flush this thing down the toilet, right? I'm going to show you that it actually has some other uses. But before we do that, let's talk about another problem. We've already discussed how it doesn't consider the time value of money. And let me demonstrate that to you. Take a look at columns A and B. Notice that they both have 100 cash outflow at time zero. And then they both, in fact, all three of these projects pay off in three years. From a payback perspective, all three of these projects are identically attractive. Yet look at project A and project B. Trust your greedy little heart and tell me, which one would you rather have, A or B? B, why? You get the money sooner, right? You're getting the same amount of money, but you're getting it sooner. And we know time value of money that a dollar today is worth more than a dollar a year from now. And so that makes perfect sense. Now, once again, though, according to Payback, those are identically attractive. Okay, so now we've got this thing figured out uh, that we're going to look at B and C. Now notice that up to the point of payback, B and C have identical cash flows. Which one's more attractive? C, why? Yeah, check that out. We've got a $60,000 cash flow in year four. I was giving this talk one night back when we had night classes. And of course, in the night class, we have people who are actually doing this stuff for a living. And this one crusty old guy, kind of like Mr. Nylon, he says, he says, that's bullshit. I have never seen cash flows like that. I said, you're absolutely right. It is bullshit. But let me give you a, a, an example where it's not bullshit. So we've got uh, project B here where it, uh, it pays off after four years, or it pays off after three years, but then you've got 60 in year four. Which would you prefer, that one or uh, a project where that 60 just repeated now on until the end of time? Yeah, we want that repeating, right? Because we know that the present value of those repeated cash flows, well, we can figure out the value to them, right? They have value. They increase shareholder wealth. Of course we would rather have that. And he agreed. He said, yeah, I've seen that. And you say, wait a minute, don't all, all projects produce cash flows forever? And the answer is no. When I was in the heavy transportation, there was a, a regulation change that was going to make this certain kind of diesel engine illegal. And so whatever you invested in that, you knew you were only going to be able to get your money out of it up until 1999. And after that, you were done, right? And so any improvements that you made to that manufacturing process were only going to get you, let's say it was 1995, it was only going to get you four, four years worth of cash flows. A lot of the projects that I worked on, they had cash flows that went on and on and on, and therefore would, uh, and I'll give an example of one here in a little bit, therefore they would be more valuable. So how do we put a name to this problem, this B versus C? The answer is uh, it doesn't account for the cash flows after payback. It doesn't account for the cash flows after payback. Notice that BNC had exactly the same payback, and you would look at that and say, well, those must be identical. But it's got this problem, it's not accounting for the cash flows after payback. And those cash flows have value. Okay, so we have, so far, given you a bunch of reasons to think that payback sucks and you probably shouldn't use it. But why do people still use it? Well, first of all, it's simple. Did you have to know how to use a TI-BA2 plus to make this thing work? No, in fact, uh, if you're clever, you could have done the numbers in your head. For small projects, it might be sufficient. Let me tell you about a project that I was involved with in 1994. 
I'm out on the shop floor. By the way, this is Duncan, Oklahoma. We're making pumps. And one of the parts for the pump are these brass rings. And the way you make brass rings is on a machine called a lathe, which is for making round stuff. And you carve the inside diameter to where you want it with a boring bar, and then you turn the outside diameter to where you want it so it matches the dimensions of the ring inside and out. And then you use what's called a part-off tool to cut these things off. And we had a guy named Ronnie who ran the machine. And he would stand there and he would catch the rings as they fell off. And he would turn around and put them in this big metal bin. And he would do that all day long. Now here's what you need to know about cutting metal. It's much like cutting your fingernails. After you cut your fingernails, are they sharp? Yeah, and what do you have to do? You have to kind of file them down. It turns out you have to do the same thing with metal. The metal is really sharp and it could hurt the assemblers and it could also impact the functioning of the equipment. And so the next operation was something called deburring. And Ronnie would grab a fork truck and he would take this big bucket of these rings over to a guy named Ralph. And Ralph sat on a stool all day long and he had this thing called a buzz gun, which is a compressed to air tool with the spins. Had a piece of flappy sandpaper on the end and he would go <laughs> And that's what he would do all day long. Can you imagine how frighteningly boring that would be, right? Okay, now, we were paying, and by, keep in mind it's 1994 dollars, we were paying Ralph $40,000 a year. To, right? Okay, Ronnie stops me one day, he says, hey, he says, I've got an idea. I said, what's your idea? He said, we could get one of those vibrating machines that has all the ceramic cones and the abrasive soap, and when I get done cutting off a ring, I could just chuck it in there and let them run, and then uh, I can fish out the rings. In fact, they'll come back around to the top, right, as it, as it vibrates and rotates. So he says, and then I'll just take them away, and you can fire Ralph. Now, here's what the part that I haven't told you yet. Ralph made a pass at Ronnie's wife. Ronnie's wife was considering her options. But Ronnie knew that his wife was smart, and she would not want a man without a job. So he's motivated, right? So I say, okay, well, let's, let's think about this. And back then, we didn't have the internet like we have it today. I had to go get something called the McMaster Car Catalog, which is a big yellow book about this thick. And we start flipping through it, and we figure out that for about $1,500, we can get Ronnie set up. Now, $1,500, and of course, we're going to have some other annual type of expenses, but certainly not going to be anywhere near $40,000, right? And so the payback was like a month and a half, right? It's very, very fast to have the payback on this. Do you think we need a net present value analysis for that? Yeah. No. Did we really need to know what the discount rate was? No. This is a freaking no-brainer, right? Okay, so we get it all set up, and it's working beautifully. Ronnie is grinning from ear to ear. And he says to me, he says, hey, when are you going to fire Ralph? <laughs> I said, Ronnie, I've got some great news. We've had a retirement in another part of the plant. So we're just going to have Ralph go over there. Ronnie hasn't spoken to me since, <laughs> that's been 30 years ago. Ronnie never spoke to me again after that because I didn't get Ralph fired. Okay. Do you see how you've got people on the shop floor? And by the way, Ronnie's not a dumb man. He's a machinist. He knows trigonometry, which probably you guys don't, right? And he, he definitely could do some complex stuff, but he's been trained to do it. It makes perfect sense for those small projects that are coming off the shop floor to use payback, right? And a lot of times people say, well, all your examples are manufacturing. Do you think there could be examples in data centers that you might have a small thing that would pay back? You know, maybe we're changing out all the fans on the, the uh, what do you call them, servers, right? For a new type of energy efficient fan, and you can figure out the payback on that pretty quickly. Would you need to know the discount rate? No. Okay, so 
That's bullet point number one. Number two, it often leads to the same conclusion as NPV. For my example with Ronnie, of course, if we'd done NPV, the NPV on that project would have been huge. It's good firms with scarce capital and lots of growth opportunities. What does scarce mean? Do we have everything that we want? No. So we say time is a scarce resource. There's a fixed amount of it, and do you ever feel like you have enough time? Think about exam two. Did you feel like you had enough <laughs> No, right? Time's a scarce resource. Okay, now, this one, it says lots of opportunities. In fact, when I went to Halliburton, it was not a lot of opportunities for growth. It was a lot of opportunities for cost savings because the company had been mismanaged for a long time. Nobody had been making any improvements. When technology would improve, they didn't do anything. And in fact, they were just doing a lot of things the hard way when they should have been doing them the easy way. So there were lots of opportunities, like the one I told you about with Ronnie, where we could invest just a little bit and make a lot of money very quickly. We had a lot of those opportunities, but we did not have endless capital. Remember that NPV theory says that if you've got a positive NPV project, then you will be able to get financing for it. Well, we've been doing such a bad, if I should say they, it was before I showed up, right? They had been doing such a bad job for so long that the capital markets were no longer interested in handing us money. And so the only capital that we had was our retained earnings, right? The net income that we had to pay out as dividends, that's what we had to work with. So we had scarce capital to work with. And so doing payback like this, if you start with a low number, like two years, like Ed Phipps had us do, then you go through and you take care of all the projects that pay off in two years or less. What do you think happens next? We still got scarce capital, we still got lots of opportunities. What do I do next? Prioritize. Okay, I'm going to raise my payback, my arbitrary cutoff, to three years, right? Now I'm going to take care of everything that pays back in three years or sooner. And this, uh, we call this the idea of low hanging fruit. Have you heard this expression before? So here's the idea. You go to visit your grandfather, and your grandfather says, would you go pick me an apple? And you say, no problem, and you go to your grandfather's apple orchard. What apple do you grab? Do you get out a ladder and go to the very top of a tree? No. You, Canada says yes, but you know. Well, you guys don't even have apple trees, do you? You do? Okay. Oh, okay. So is that out west? Uh, it's towards Seattle, thank you. Yeah, exactly. So, so we grow a lot of apples in Washington. The Canadians are drafting off of our efforts. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so you go out to the orchard, and you're going to pick a low-hanging fruit, right? You're not going to get one with a worm, but you're going to get one that you can reach. And so we're calling these projects that are just like no-brainers. We're calling those low-hanging fruit. But eventually, you run out of fruit at this level. What does that mean? Now I move up to the next level. I raise that payback to three years. And then once I've gotten all that fruit picked, what do you think I do? Canada, now that you know how this game is played, what am I going to do to my payback period? Yeah, we're going to go to four years. By the way, I wanted to ask you, did, when you lived in Canada, did you ever watch a show called Murdoch Mysteries? Yes. I love that show. Okay, back to the story. So, uh, scarce capital, lots of opportunities for improvement, or lots of opportunities for growth. By the way, another example here would be a startup company. Uh, do you think that startup companies have endless amounts of money? Not unless they have idiots for investors, right? A startup company is very risky, and if I'm going to invest in a startup company, in fact, you can look at it, there are various stages of financing, right? There's what's called seed financing, and then there's, it goes through, and then you get to mezzanine financing, and then finally, they do an IPO. 
And so people aren't just handing them wads of cash as much as they want, they're giving them limited amounts. So what do these startups have to do? They have to prioritize what they're going to spend their money on, and one of the ways that they can do that is by starting with a very low required payback period. And then finally, it provides quicker feedback on managerial decision making. What do we mean by that? Look at the set of cash flows below. We call this a hockey stick diagram. Can you see why it's called a hockey stick diagram? Of course Canada can. <laughs> okay, so it looks like a hockey stick, right? I was teaching a class in 2003 and I had a guest speaker and we had just been through the dot-com bust. And so here's this guy and he is the head of a bank in St. Louis. And he comes in and he was like, yeah, we were accepting all these projects with these hockey stick cash flow projections. He said, that was so dumb. He said, we'll never do that again. And then he paused and he says, oh, who am I kidding? Of course we will. And where were we with the, and 10 years later, we're having another problem, right? And so what happens is people will come up with these cash flow projections. Why do you think someone would want you to think that that's what their cash flow projections were going to look like? What does it do to the NPV? Yeah, all I have to do to make this a positive NPV project is to inflate cash flows. Now, if I'm going to inflate the cash flows, by the way, people are scumbags, if I'm going to inflate them, do I inflate year one? No, man. Do I inflate year two? No. Year three? No. Where do I start? Maybe year four, maybe year five, maybe year six, right? And then I just crank it until it uh, comes out a positive NPV project. Why? Because I want my project to get accepted. I was working at Halliburton. This is before Ed Phipps gave us the two-year payback. Working with this guy named Dan. And Dan had this set of cash flows that looked like this. I'm like, Dan, you know that's total crap, right? He's like, yeah. I'm like, why are you doing it? He says, I want to get this project accepted. I said, what's going to happen in year four? He says, well, I'm going to tell you two things. Number one, these people don't even bother to go back and audit the cash flows to see if a project really pays off. And number two, I'll be promoted by then. The funny thing was, like a month later, they, they announced this new initiative to start auditing the cash flows projects. I, I've never seen anyone look more scared than Dan, right? Because Dan knows it's going to come up on him now. Now, here's what's bad. Dan did get promoted to manager within his three-year time frame. Now, think about this. How long do you think the average American manager stays in a job? Yeah. So do you see why people might throw such crap out there? Is it right? No. Payback, though, payback, if I'm holding them to a payback, then uh, it's the early cash flows that matter, right? You can't fool payback with these hockey stick things. Now, I was giving the same talk to a group of Chinese EMBA students, and they were from the China Association of Iron and Steel Companies, and so I had all these steel people in there. And I said, anytime you see a set of cash flows that looks like this, it's a lie. And they said, all of our projects look like that. And I said, all of your projects are undoubtedly crap. And they said, no. And here's why. They were bringing new steel manufacturing capacity online. And in the first three years, they could only sell to the domestic automakers. But after they had a three-year track record of quality production, then they could start selling to the German and Japanese car makers. And so in their case, it really did, oh crap, it really did make sense to have the hockey stick cash flow projections.
Okay. Any questions on that? Your book mentions discounted payback. And I want you to know that discounted payback is a piece of crap. Let's talk about why discounted payback is a piece of crap. So people point out that uh, payback doesn't account for time value of money. So what they say is, wait, wait a minute. All we need to do is figure out the appropriate discount rate. And then we can find the present value for those future cash flows. And instead of just looking at the nominal, the future value amounts, we'll look at the present value amounts. And that will give us this accounting for time value of money. It sounds good, but this is actually a piece of crap. And here's why. If I've got the initial investment, the future cash flows and their timing, and a discount uh, that is according to the risk of the project, what could I do? Ms. Calder, what could I use? Compute NPV. Yeah, I could compute NPV. And remember earlier we said that that's our gold standard, three stars, right? If I'm going to go to the time and trouble to come up with a discount rate appropriate to the risk, I'm not going to do this dog with fleas. This still has problems, right? It doesn't account for the cash flows after payback. It's still problematic. And so discounted payback to me seems a hell of a lot like meatloaf. Let me tell you about meatloaf. So my mom used to take these uh, three or four ingredients. We'll count them as I go here. Ground beef, crackers, eggs, and ketchup. Now, individually, I quite enjoy all of those things, right? Well, what would my mom do? She would turn this into an abomination known as meatloaf. This was awful. My mom, the cow shouldn't have to die for this, right? So to me, this thing is like meatloaf. It's taking great ingredients and making crap out of it. Now, there are always two people in the class that like meatloaf. Raise your hands. Damn, this is an extraordinary class. Hey, you're you're in. In. He's saying, he said, this is all I was here. We well, haven't had it the right way. Right? And my mom would confess to not being a very good cook. No, I didn't starve to death as a child, so you know there's that. <laughs> OK. so. Am I going to make you do discounted payback for homework? No. No. Am I going to make you do discounted payback for an exam? No. No. On the promise that you can give the meatloaf speech to any future boss that might ask you to use this dog with fleas, right? It's a piece of crap. Any questions? Okay, now we're on to the average accounting return, or AAR. And it turns out there's only one thing that accountants love more than numbers, and that uh, is words. And so here we go. AAR is the average project earnings after taxes and depreciation divided by the average book value of an investment over its life. Holy crap. Couldn't we just say average net income over average book value, isn't that the same thing? It is. It is. And so if I were you, what I would write on my note sheet is average net income over average book value. Don't worry about using all the words that the accountants do. So what do we need for this? We need the projected accounting earnings. Remember when we say earnings in accounting, we're talking about <coughs> Net income. Now I'm going to ask you this really quickly. Is net income cash? No, there's all sorts of non-cash crap in net income. Depreciation has been subtracted out. We have accounts uh, payable uh, that we haven't spent cash yet on. We've got accounts receivable we haven't collected cash yet for. All sorts of things that keep net income from being cash. Number two, we need an investment amount and a depreciation schedule. Hopefully you guys learned about depreciation in a prior class. Uh, we're going to, for our examples, we'll use straight line depreciation. Um, why do we need a depreciation schedule? We'll take a look. First of all, if we haven't been given net income, we're going to have to calculate net income. And in order to calculate net income, we need to know on depreciation, right? need to know depreciation. 
The second thing is, in the numerator of this, no, in the denominator of this thing, we're looking at average book value. And the book value of something is the historical cost minus the accumulated depreciation. The book value is the historical cost minus the accumulated depreciation. So we need depreciation to be able to figure out the top part, the net income, and the bottom part, the book value. And then finally, we need a minimum acceptable AAR. This is another arbitrary cutoff. Now this time, who would the arbitrary cutoff come from? It would probably come from your firm's controller. Actually, it's pronounced contro controller. And in French, this is what it would look like, but it still sounds like right? And so this is what it sounds like. In other words, it's your company's top accountant, probably the person that's giving you this number. Now, how are they coming up with this number? Well, you, if you take a look at this thing, it looks a lot like return on assets. And so they might base it on the firm's ROA. Well, our firm's currently got an ROA of 7%, so any project that's better than that uh, will accept. We'll talk about why that might be a problem here in a little bit. What's the rule? Well, we accept all AAR greater than or equal to the minimum AAR greater than or equal to, right? Keep both of those in mind. And that minimum AAR is that arbitrary cutoff. So here's our example. <clears throat> and the first thing I want to tell you, because it's not explicitly written up here, is that the initial investment is $500,000. The initial investment is $500,000. Go ahead and write that on there. The initial investment of is $500,000. And we've got uh, our income statement for years one through five that tells us the net income for the project for those years. We can figure out our average net income quite easily. We've got five years of net income numbers. All I have to do is add them together, right? Year one, year two, year three, year four, year five, add them together, and then divide by what to get average? Yeah, divide by five because we've got five net income numbers. Easy enough to do, and we see that our average net income is $50,000. Now, the average investment is a little trickier. First of all, we need to know the initial amount of our investment, which we said was $500,000. Let's see, let's do book value, depreciation. So at time zero, our book value here is $500,000. We're doing straight line depreciation to zero over the life of the project. And the project has five years. We already know that because we had um, five net incomes. Okay, how much depreciation happens at time zero? Zero, right? Okay, now at time one, we have 100,000 in depreciation. What does that do to my book value? Yeah, it's now 400,000. What's the depreciation at time two? 100,000. What does that do to my book value? 300,000. What's the depreciation of time three? 100,000. What does that do to my book value of time three? 100,000. Brings me down to 100,000. And then I have 100,000 here. What happens? Zero. zero. Now, remember we said we were straight line depreciating to zero over its life. If I didn't get down to zero at year five, I've done something wrong, right? Okay, now I've got all of these book values, and I'm going to figure out the average book value. I'm going to add all these together and divide by what? Six! Why six? Yeah, we've got a time zero now, right? Before, we only had times one through five. Now we have time zero through five, which is a total of six observations. And so we're going to add all that up, divide by six, and it's going to give us 200 
$250,000. Now, I want you to notice that $250,000 is exactly one half of $500,000. That's not a coincidence. Write this down. If you are straight line depreciating, if you are straight line depreciating, if you are straight line depreciating, an asset to zero, an asset to zero, an asset to zero over its useful life, over its useful life, over its useful life, the average book value will always be one half the initial investment. The average book value will always be one half the initial investment. The average book value will always be one half the initial investment. Sometimes it freaks out students when they see a problem and they see the solution and they basically just say 500,000 divided by two and that's our average. They don't understand that that's always true if we are straight line depreciating to zero over the life of the asset, um, it will always be exactly one half the initial investment, your average book value. Questions? Okay, so now we've got five or 50,000 as our average net income. We've got 250,000 as our average investment. Uh, 50 divided by 250 gives us 20%. If our arbitrary cutoff is 25%, do we accept or reject the project? We reject it. What if the average or the uh, lowest acceptable AAR is 15%? What do we do? We accept it. What if our AAR cutoff is 20%? What do we do? Yeah, accept it because it's greater than or equal to, right? Okay, now one other thing I want to point out here. Uh, look up here, your taxes in year five are negative. Is there really such a thing as negative taxes? For the overall company, no. So, uh, for instance, I've got this little uh, company that I've started. This is a true story. I have started this little company, and for 2023, I had a loss. Do you think if that were a standalone company paying corporate taxes, the government would say, oh, you poor person, here's some money. That's not how it works. It's one way with the government, right? Now, how then could we possibly have negative taxes here? And it's because we are going to make the following assumption. We are going to assume that this project is being done by an otherwise profitable company and that that otherwise profitable company is going to have more than $16,667 in taxes it owes elsewhere that it can use this loss to offset. By the way, I actually got to do that on my personal taxes because uh, having this job turns out is a profitable project, right? And so uh, it just basically reduced my net in or my adjusted gross income for the year, and so I paid less in taxes. If it were a standalone firm, I wouldn't have gotten a check from Uncle Sam. So that's the assumption. So don't freak out when you see negative taxes in a project, but if you see a company that claims they're paying negative taxes, start asking some questions. So it's, it's negative because they're writing off the losses of the project. Yeah, so this, this offset, this taxes, this negative tax here, will offset the positive taxes that they owe elsewhere in the company. So let's assume that they owed $50,000 elsewhere in the company. Well, after using this $16,667 negative, they would really only owe $33,333. Does that make sense? Am I losing you? You look kind of sleepy. Oh, okay. See, this is the problem when you're young. You don't value sleep, and then you can be my age, you're freaking tired, right? Okay, now let's talk about AAR and our three questions. Number one, does it account for the time value of money? No. no. It treated the net income in year one the same way it treated the net income in year five. Even if they did represent cash, it's not accounting 
for the time value of money? Did it account for the riskiness of the cash flow? No. Now, and sometimes accountants say, well, well, no, wait, 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 wait. We would require a higher AAR for riskier projects. And I would say, great, tell me what scientific method you use to determine that higher AAR. And then there would be some uh, 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 right? Because it's still just a number that they pulled out of their butts. By the way, that process is known as angle extrapolation, right? When you just pull a number out of your ass. Okay. Um, does it provide information regarding the wealth created by the project? Not in the least. Not in the least. So, how many stars are we going to give this thing? Zero. Now, why do people still use AAR? The numbers are readily available and people are lazy. What do I mean by the numbers are readily available? Let me tell you about my accountant, a man named Jack Heffelfinger. This is at Halliburton. And, and Jack was the only man in the business unit that uh, was by himself in an office and he had no windows. So it's like a cave, right? And he's in there under the fluorescent lights and he's in there with his spreadsheets and his numbers. And the, the way you could make Jack happy is you go by and you say, hey Jack, I need some numbers. And Jack would say, first of all, human contact. Secondly, he loved doing the spreadsheets, right? And so it was real easy for me, and I'm lazy. It's real easy for me to get these kind of numbers because poof, Jack would just, yeah, oh yeah. Okay, so that's number one. Number two, it's easy to calculate. Did we need the TIBA2 plus? No. Now, both of those reasons are absolute crap, not realistic reasons that we should do this. But number three starts to make a little bit of sense because the stockholders and the media pay attention to accounting returns. You'll hear people on Bloomberg and CNBC talking about ROE and ROA. And if you look at AAR, we said it looks a whole lot like return on assets. Now that sounds realistic that you'd say, well, wait a minute, if you'll just accept projects with uh, ROA is higher than your firm's overall ROA, that doing so will lift the ROA. That all sounds great and fine until I tell you that the reason the ROA on these new projects is so high is because they're extraordinarily risky. And so we could just be accepting negative NPV projects that have ROAs higher than the arbitrary cutoff. Sure, it's going to be pushing up the ROA of the firm, but not at a rate that's going to chase that extra risk that we're taking on. So that's not a good reason. And then finally, sometimes your boss is an accountant. Your boss is an accountant. So when I was at Halliburton, uh, the first CEO that I worked for was a guy named Thomas Crookshank. He came out of the operations side. And then the next guy that we had was an Arthur Anderson accountant. And suddenly, for some reason, we have to start figuring average accounting return. Why? The boss is an accountant. Okay, so let's say you're working for an accountant, and your boss says, we need to do an analysis on this new machine. I want you to do AAR. And if it's higher than 20%, we'll accept it, or if, it, if it's, the cutoff is 20%. And you say, okay. Now, here's what you need to do. First of all, you need to do what your boss told you to do. You need to do AAR. But secondly, you need to go ahead and do NPV. And if they both come to the same conclusion that we accept the project, you just go to your boss and you say, boss, you're a genius. That project is 25% uh, AAR. We accept the project. What if the AAR uh, is 15% and then you run the NPV and it shows uh, negative? You go say, boss, I'm sorry that we didn't quite make the AAR of that project. You don't even have to mention the NPV. But what if the NPV and the AAR disagree? Let's assume that the AAR says take the project and the NPV says run away from it. What do you do? You go to your boss and you say, I ran the numbers and the AAR came out greater than 20%. However, just to double check, I did NPV and it turns out this project has a negative NPV and will destroy shareholder value. Your boss says, 
doesn't matter. AAR greater than 20%, we do the project. What's your response? I'm going to ask our veteran. When your, your boss tells you, I don't go in order, what do you do? You do it. Yes, sir, right? Yeah. Now, here's what you do. You say, yes, sir. And then you go back to your desk. And this is, keep in mind that when I'm doing this is back before we all had computers on our desk. I had a long book. And I pulled it out and I wrote down, today, Bob asked me to do an evaluation on replacing machine 237. And then I write down exactly what happened. I said it was a bad idea. Bob said we're doing it anyway. I close the book. I shove it in the drawer. Now, why do I do that? Because eventually the investigation happens, right? And they come to me and they're like, Haggard, your name is all over this dog turd of a project. And I say, do you mean the replacement of machine 237? And they say, yes. I say, just a minute, and I pull out my logbook and I read to them. On July 14th, Bob asked me, and I read him the whole thing. I say, Would you like a copy? <laughs> right? What do you think happens next? Bob get I wonder if either me or Bob's gonna get fired, right? <laughs> I, I was on my way to getting fired to begin with, because remember the whole dog turd comment. Um, I'm on my way to get fired, but perhaps now they're like, you know what? This guy's actually smart. Bob's the moron. How about we fire Bob and promote Haggard? How about that? Right? Okay. Questions? Now let's talk about the internal rate of return. People often listen to this definition and they just let it fly right over them, but I'm going to tell you it should be on your note sheet. This definition should be on your note sheet. IRR is simply the discount rate that makes the net present value of a project zero. It is the discount rate that makes the net present value of a project zero. So what is our rule? We accept all projects with IRR greater than the appropriate discount rate. By the way, that appropriate discount rate is the same appropriate discount rate that we use for NPV. It's the same discount rate. Okay. Now, if, and, and this is a, there are exceptions, and we'll talk about them. But generally, if the IRR is greater than the appropriate discount rate, then the NPV is positive. If the IRR is lower than the appropriate discount rate, then the NPV is negative. What if the IRR is equal to the appropriate discount rate? What's the NPV? If the IRR is equal to the appropriate discount rate, the NPV is equal to zero. Because after all, the IRR is a discount rate that makes the net present value of a project zero. Okay, what do we need for IRR? Well, we need the initial investment amount, we need the future cash flows and their timing, and we need a discount rate appropriate to the risk of the future cash flows. And you may be looking at that and saying, wait a minute, we know that NPV is the best measure, and we know this takes the same ingredients as NPV, is he going to call this one meatloaf? And the answer is no. I am not going to call this one meatloaf, and we'll talk about why. So here is a simple example. You've got a project that will pay $110 one year from today for an investment of $100 today. What is the IRR? How do we do IRR? Well, the first thing we do is we set up the NPV equation. The NPV is equal to our additional investment minus 100 plus the present value of the future cash flows. In this case, there's only one. So we're going to take 110 divided by 1 plus r to the first power. You just don't see it. It's there. And that's the present value of that cash flow that happens at time 1. And when I do the math, or then, then remember, our NPV has to be equal to 0 in order for this thing to be the IRR. And so what we're going to do is set NPV equal to 0, and then we're going to solve for r. 
And it's really, really easy in this problem to solve for R and come out with R being 10%. You say, wow, this is cake, but perhaps not. What if you had multiple years? What if we had something that looked like this? Do I have any mathematicians in here? I didn't think so. Okay, so let me tell you about this. This, uh, there is no way to mathematically, to algebraically solve for R. There is no way. And so the only way we know how to solve for this is through a process called iteration. Iteration is repeated guessing. How do you do it? Well, I start out with an R, and if my NPV comes out to be zero, I just got lucky, right? And that's my IRR. But let's say that I put in 5% here, and this thing ended up being positive. That means my estimate of R is too low. And so then I'm going to try perhaps 7%. And now this thing comes out negative. That means my guess was too high. Where do you think I go next? Yeah, I'm going to go for 6%. And I'm going to keep this going back and forth, back and forth, back and forth until I get close enough and I'm like, you know what, that's good. Would you like to do that during an exam? No. I had to do this during heat transfer uh, calculations and mechanical engineering. <gasps> and whether or not you were able to complete the exam, had most to do with how good your first guess was. Doesn't that suck? Do you really want to go through that? Absolutely not. But you guys, you guys are so fortunate. We have the TI BA2 Plus. The TI BA2 Plus is a much better guesser than you are, a much faster guesser than you are. And so that's how we're going to solve these problems. So here we go. We have, by the way, if you don't have your calculator out, go ahead and get it out. You should always have your calculator, calculator out and be ready for action in this class. Uh, we're gonna, we've got an investment of $200 today that gets you $100 a year for the next three years. So I'm going to use the CF key, CF, second, clear work. CF zero is 200 negative, why is it negative? That's cash outflow, right? Enter, arrow down. C01 is 100. 100. Enter, arrow down. What is that, 01? Three. Three, why? Yeah, three years in a row. Okay, now I'm going to hit the NPV, or no, not the NPV key. What button do you think I'm going to hit here? IRR. IRR, it's got the name right on it. Do you think that means the IRR is zero? No. no, what's the calculator telling me I have to do? Yeah, you gotta hit the compute button. And when I do, I get that it's 23.375%, 23.375%. And so if my appropriate discount rate was 20%, I would be accepting this. If my appropriate discount rate was 25%, I would be rejecting it. By the way, when you do this on a real calculator, not on this projected one, but when you do it on a real calculator, watch and see how long it takes for your calculator to calculate IRR versus calculating NPV. NPV is a straight calculation. There's no iteration, there's no guessing involved. But when you hit that IRR button, here's what your calculator looks like for just a split second. Right? And if the screen blanks and then boop, it comes back with an answer, it's actually guessing. And the processor in your calculator is so slow that you can actually see that process. Pretty cool. Okay, now let's ask these questions. Number one, does IRR account for the time value of money? 
yeah, we're looking at the present value of these future cash flows. It does. Number two, does it account for the riskiness of the cash flows? Yes, how? Yeah, that discount rate that we're comparing against, it is according to the risk of the cash flows. And then finally, does it provide information regarding the wealth created by the project? Raise your hand if you think the answer is yes. Raise your hand if you think the answer is no. Raise your hand if you're one of the other 23 people who didn't raise your hand. <laughs> okay, I'm going to tell you that it's yes and no. So, does it tell us whether we are creating wealth? Yes. Does it tell us how much? No. So I'm going to give this thing a half star for that last question, and we're going to say IRR is a 2.5 star measure. It tells us whether we're creating or destroying wealth, but it doesn't tell us how much. Questions? Now let's talk about some problems with IRR. Mutually exclusive. Let's talk about what mutually exclusive means. Let's assume that you are in the United States. How many people can you be married to at a time in the United States? For right now, one. Right? I could change. Okay. Now, let's assume that today you get two marriage proposals. In some places in the world, you could say yes to both, right? Yes. But here, because of our law, you can't. That means it is a mutually, these are mutually exclusive projects. Let me give you an example that probably hits closer to home. So undoubtedly, many of you applied to and were also accepted into Harvard's MBA program and here. Could you go to both programs? No. It's a mutually exclusive thing. If you do one, you can't do the other. Now, I have some good news for you. You made the right decision. First of all, number one, we know that they don't know about the fallacy of the single weighted average cost of capital for every project. We know that, right? Uh, number two, this place is a whole lot more affordable. And number three, the school colors are the same. So you made the right call. Okay. So. If we're living in a world of independent projects where accepting or rejecting a project, one project has nothing to do with another, remember the NPV rule says accept all positive NPV projects. But when you get down to dealing with mutually exclusive projects, you can't do that. You can only accept one of them. So we've got two projects here. We could either build a snow cone stand on a street corner in Los Angeles, or we could build a really nice nightclub. Let's talk about the cash flow. So uh, they're both three-year projects. Uh, they're both going to have the same discount rate. By the way, apparently they're equally risky projects. Who knew, right? Um, but they're going to have different cash flows. The snow cone stand is going to cost you a lot less to get started, but then the cash flows are less too. The nightclub is going to require a more significant investment, uh, but then the cash flows you'll see are also bigger. Which one should we take? Well, let's get our calculator out here. CF, second, clear work. What should I put in for CF zero for the snow cone stand? 100. Negative. Enter. Arrow down. What is C? Zero. One. Fifty. Enter. Arrow down. What is F? Zero. One. Three. Enter. And then I'm going to compute the IRR. Compute. 23.375%. Write that down. And I also want to point out that we've already seen this number once today, right? Yeah. And this is going to get to one of the problems of IRR. It only looks at the relative size of the cash flows. It doesn't look at the absolute return on the project. So what we're talking about here is uh, the first cash flow is twice as big as the next three. And then there are no more cash flows. 
Anytime I have that situation, the IRR will always be 23.375%. Always, always, always. If I invest 4 million to get 2 million, 2 million, 2 million, I guarantee you the IRR will be 23.375%. Try it at home. Just try it with a bunch of different combinations like that. You'll see you'll always get 23.375%. Now, while we still have these numbers in the calculator, here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to hit NPV, and everybody knows the snow cones require 10% return. 10, enter, arrow down, compute. Our NPV for this project is 24.34. I want you to write that down. The NPV for this project is 24.34. And the next time we get together, we will do a similar analysis for the nightclub, and then we're going to make a decision as to where we're going to invest our money, or what we're going to do.